Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. This is episode 22, and I'm very fortunate to have Sohee Lee, a.k.a. Sohee Fit on the IG. Thank you, Sohee, for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, guys, if you don't know who Sohee is, you're obviously not on Instagram and you're not big on social <laughs> media, so that's okay. We will forgive you this time. So he is a she's a master's candidate uh, in health psychology, uh, studying willpower and motivation, and she's a graduate from Stanford with a bachelor in human biology. So she's a quite intelligent uh, lady, if I dare say so. And she's also a writer, online coach. She's a bikini pro. She's powerlifted. She's an author as well now. She just wrote a book, uh, Eat, Lift, Thrive, which. Feels so weird. Hear that. I'm yeah, an author. that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's absolutely killing it in the fitness industry. She's doing some great things. And as we were discussing before the podcast, she's making some of the best infographics around. So if you're somebody who's time poor and doesn't want to necessarily read the research, uh, but want to understand the important messages, make sure you go check her out. She's got some really good content, and I'm sure you guys will benefit from that. So. I really like Sohee's approach to training and nutrition because, as I mentioned, she's evidence-based uh, but has a really good knack for being able to apply that to the real world without getting too caught up in the nuances. And that's what we do at JPS. So super excited to have Sohee on today. And let's get into it, guys. So welcome, Sohee. Awesome. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready to talk uh, all things fitness. And I wanted to start off with motivation, willpower, and self-control. So obviously, uh, uh, okay. obviously these are some things that you know, you've know you spoken about quite often and I've heard you talk about and write about before. So I'm not necessarily new to this, but as we said, I think you know getting this information out there more is always a good thing. So motivation is often the blame for an individual's inability to achieve their goals, right? So we blame our motivation or you know we're lacking motivation and we just need to be stronger willed. Um, can you explain to listeners why motivation may not necessarily be the reason why they're unable to successfully improve their body composition? Oh, gosh. So motivation, first of all, is uh, – so I've, I've heard both extremes. I've heard, do you need motivation to do anything? <laughs> and then on the other side, you hear people saying, motivation is useless. Look mm-hmm. at Bruce Lee. Uh, I think both, extreme, both extremes are not quite uh, correct – um, I think motivation can be good for a lot of things, especially when, obviously, when you start out on a new fitness journey, for example, your, high, your motivation is an all-time high. But it is a fact that motivation is going to fluctuate over time. You're not always going to motivate, be motivated. You may be stressed, tired, you have a lot of other stuff going on, and you just may not feel like doing, uh, going to the gym and doing your workout like you used to a week ago. You're not, you're not as gung-ho. Um, so I think motivation can be really, really good for helping you get started and for helping you to do... Um, difficult things one time but relying on motivation to do everything you need to do to get achieve some long-term goal um, because of the fact that motivation is unreliable I say it's fickle so it's kind Mm -hmm. of fluctuating over time um, there's going to be a time where some action needs maybe you make your your behavior goal too difficult to do that requires this much motivation but one one day you're down here um, so you're not going to, you're not going to do it that day. And if you always think I just need more motivation and you're always mm-hmm. trying to find, um, maybe external ways of motivating yourself, like watching a YouTube video <laughs> or listening to some speech, it's been worth in the short term, mm-hmm. but uh, can, imagine how exhausting it is. If every single hour you have to find some way to get motivated and get pumped up. <laughs> so rather than relying on motivation, um, I prefer to, uh, one set behavior goals that actually are realistic and mm-hmm. small enough that you can um, adhere to them every day, regardless of how you're feeling, regardless mm-hmm. of what you're in. So the vast majority of the time, you should say, "Okay, you know what? I'm not feeling that motivated right now, but my behavior goal for today is so doable that it doesn't even bother me. I'm just going to go do it. It'll take me so little time and so little effort." And um, my thing is more about building the momentum. Mm-hmm. Um, building, stringing together a bunch of small wins. You know, I say yeah. small wins. No matter how big, no matter how small those successes are, if you can string them together and build momentum all over time, 
what that's going to do is build confidence. And mm -hmm. uh, eventually you're going to be doing so well that you don't want to break that streak. So you'll kind of, um, so that in itself may then, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, m motivate you in that way to, to continue on your path. But um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the reason why people don't end up reaching their goals is that they rely on motivation or self-control or willpower. And, but all of those things are unreliable. They, they mm. are not consistent. They high all the time. Um, so yeah, that's really it. Yeah. I think you touched on a lot of good points there. And I guess we need to set ourselves up to make, uh, you know, these behaviors easier because if we're always in an environment or our lifestyles really making it difficult to do a certain thing, then we're not going to do it. Um, so for those people who are, you know, looking to change behaviors, what are some important tips, I guess, you could give Sohi so that they can change their environment and lifestyle to minimize the amount of, you know, willpower, self-control and motivation they need? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, before I begin, there is, there's one really big thing you can do, but before I address that, I do want to say, I want to address the misconception that in order to change behavior, you need to rely on tons and tons of willpower. Um, that is true, but not in the way that people think. Mm -hmm. So the goal yeah. is to actually develop the right habits over time. Mm -hmm. Habits are um, on the other side of self-control in that habits actually don't rely on any self-control. They mm -hmm. happen automatically. Um, you usually have some cue or trigger, then your behavior happens, the automatic habit, and then you have some reward. So there's the habit feedback loop. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a kind of positive reinforcing loop. Um, and the cool thing about that is it usually happens um, – Without, your, without you having to exert any extra cognitive effort. So maybe, uh, you know, there are good habits and bad habits. Maybe you bite your nails when you're anxious. That's a bad habit. Maybe you brush your teeth for two minutes every morning and every night. That's a good habit. Maybe you floss your teeth. That's another good habit. Um, so the thing with habits is it actually takes extra work to not perform a given behavior. On the other hand, with a behavior that requires self-control, it's easier not to do it, and you have to actually exert cognitive effort to make it happen. Um, so I just gave a presentation at the ISSN conference here, uh, a little, little less than a month ago. And I, um, put together this graph of these arbitrary numbers and arbitrary hundred point scale. But basically I showed that, um, the self-control and habits like were this, yep. this, where, um, in the beginning when you're trying to work on a behavior, trying to make it a habit, it's going to, so here's like, let's say like this is habit automaticity, you know, how automatic is the given behavior. And then this is the self-control needed. So in the beginning, a time point, you need a lot of self-control and mm -hmm. the behavior is not very automatic, right? Mm -hmm. However, with repeated practice, so habit strength gets yeah. improves with repetition. The more you perform a habit, the more automatic it becomes. So over time, the more you practice it, the less self-control you need until until eventually, you know, you cross the intersection point and then the habit strength is so strong that you need virtually zero uh, self-control to make it happen. Okay. So it's not about relying on self-control all the time. It's about utilizing it just enough to form habits mm -hmm. and then relying on habits long term. Okay. Um, and then so to go back to your original question, one of the ways to change behavior that actually does not rely on self-control is to engineer your environment, your physical environment. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a really cool study from 2012 and Thorndike um, on choice architecture interventions. Mm -hmm. And what they do there is they have a... Um, Boston, Massachusetts cafeteria, hospital cafeteria, and they uh, have you know, water bottles in given sta in certain stations and whatnot, and sodas. And they don't, no one knows this is happening. So, unbeknownst to the, the the cafeteria workers and the people who work in the hospital, what they do is they change the setup of the cafeteria. So they place uh, more water bottle stations all around the cafeteria. Um, in the refrigerators, they move the water bottles to the front and move the sodas to the back. So you can still get the sodas, you just have to reach behind it. And um, basically just made the water bottles uh, more accessible, easy, easier to reach, you know, right next to the cashier and so on. And what they, what they found was that just by doing that alone, soda sales dropped significantly. And water yeah. bottle sales went. Um, so that can be a really good way to uh, reduce calorie intake without realizing you're reducing it. Um, and something I, I like to say and – um, I try to word it correctly so people don't get mad, <laughs> but humans are inherently lazy. And the goal, <laughs> so the goal in this case is to design your environment for laziness. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bowl of fruit out on your kitchen counter 
and you have chocolate bars tucked away in the back of your pantry, which are you more likely to reach for? It's, it's a, a no-brainer. Um, on the flip side, you can also engineer your environment to make poor food choices. So um, a lot of times when you do that, you end up automatically changing your behavior without realizing you're doing it. So if I take a, a trash can in your home and I move it across the room, what are you going to do the next time you want to throw something yeah. out? You walk across the room. There you go. I changed your behavior. Um, so that's something that uh, anyone can do in their home, in their office, wherever they spend more time. If you have a bowl of chocolates out on your office desk, you're probably going to be more likely to eat it throughout the day without even realizing you're going to find yourself reaching for it. But if you keep it out of sight, uh, make it difficult to get to, then you probably, your, your consumption will drop by a good amount. So change your environment. Um, other things for behavior change start small. Mm -hmm. So uh, stick with what you can do consistently. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about building success, setting yourself up for success. Um, and, it's, and it's good not just for a progress standpoint, but from a mental standpoint, from a confidence standpoint, um, I, I think you'll feel a lot better if you're able to go 30 straight days consistently hitting a small, uh, seemingly small behavior goal uh, rather than setting something, you know, setting a behavior goal that's way too realistic mm. and then last maybe three or four days before you plop. And that's actually a phenomenon, a psychological phenomenon called the hot cold empathy gap. Um, and it's a cool phenomenon that describes when, you know, right now, I let's say, you know, it's New Year's, January 1st, I'm feeling this is the year I'm going to lose weight for good. And I say this eight in a row, right? But this year for real. This <laughs> and... Um, I'm so motivated. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go on this crash diet. I'm going to go to the gym six days a week, two hours a day. I'm going to eat these 12 sad food items and cry into my lettuce every day. <laughs> but this is what it's going to take to get to where I want to be. And you're so motivated. But you, you fail to um, empathize how difficult circumstances are going to be maybe one or two weeks from now when you're not feeling so much, when you're hungry. Yeah. So right now I'm well fed. You no, know, I'm well rested. I feel great. I'm in a good mood. When I'm hungry, when I'm tired, when I get into a fight, you know, with with my loved ones, and I'm I'm, I'm having a lot of stress at work, all these things are going to affect my my levels of motivation. And when that happens, adhering to my goal is the last thing I'm going to do. So that yeah. hot cold empathy gap explains why so many people have such a hard time. Um, they set such unrealistic goals in the beginning, and they swear up and down, "Yes, I am going to adhere to it. No problem. I am motivated." Um, that's a big, big mistake. Yeah. I think there are a lot of brilliant points there. And I'm, I last night, literally last night, I put my ice cream in the back fridge, which is all the way down the hall in the garage. And last night I was sitting on the couch. I'm like, damn, I want some ice cream. Nah, too hard. And I didn't have it. And that just goes to show, you know, how powerful changing your environment to make these things harder can be. And you know, again, I always ask my clients, and I'm sure you probably do the same, Sohi, when they present to you these unrealistic, uh, you know, diet plans and behaviors, can you do this in six months' time? Like, are you going to be able to do this in 12 months' time? Right. And if the answer is yeah. if the answer's no, then, you know, it may not be a sustainable approach to, you know, your fitness journey. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, obviously... Yeah. I love, I love asking that question. Sorry, just to add. That's I love asking that question because most people don't even think that far ahead. Yeah, exactly. You go, right. <laughs> um, I was only thinking three months from now. So um, now that I think about it, probably not. So it gets them to think, you know, for what I, what they actually, you know, when the people say they want to lose weight, they actually mean I want to lose weight and keep it off. They don't mm -hmm. mean I want to lose weight and then put it all back on, which is what is the norm. And so getting them to just shift their perspective a little bit, that can make a big, big difference. Exactly right. And uh, moderation is difficult. You know, it is it is that gray area. It's not sexy. Telling people to make small behavior changes, you yeah. know, it, does, it doesn't sell. And, you know, trying to overhaul is, you know, the common uh, default that people will take because that's, you know, how we're ingrained to think. And that's a story for another day. So how does somebody change their perception, so he of, you know, understanding that moderation is what is required if they're so used to this you know quick fix chase and they yeah. want everything now how yeah. do they how do they accept that it needs to be a slow process because that's difficult for a lot of people yeah so my thinking is uh i i approach it from multiple angles i mean if you you or other people who follow me on social media see that um i normally talk about moderation all the time 
but I also always show how I do it. Mm. And, um, you know, every mm. month or so, you know, I'm not big on progress pictures or anything, but, you know, every now and then I'll post a picture and be like, here's what I look like now. If you see, um, I'm as moderate as ever. Uh, here's what I do with my workouts. Here's what I do with my nutrition. I really don't um, do anything remotely extreme. Mm. And yet this is the lineage yeah. I've been able to maintain year round since ever. And um, uh, one thing that did really well was showing um, a few months ago pictures of when I was anorexic, when I was binge eating, and then me now. And showing that the first two phases, I was being extreme and extreme. And in neither of those cases did I look like how I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I also talk about, you know, the more extreme the methods, the harder the rebound, and really kind of drilling them into people's heads. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm so big on repeating the same message over and over and over in all different formats and different images, different wording, different infographics, is that, um, you know, sometimes, so, sometimes something doesn't quite click for someone mm -hmm. at a given time point. Maybe they're um, in a life, at, at a time in their lives when they're not really ready to to be open-minded to what you have to say just yet, or maybe they just don't fully understand. But maybe two months from now, if I say the same thing, they'll be like, oh my God, I fully I get understand, it. understand that. that can, that's worth it to me. For me yeah. to be like, I'm just gonna say it again and again and again and again. And um, so I think it's good to not only present the research, um, which you know very much is in support of everything I'm saying as far as modern methods, et cetera, uh, but also really encouraging people to think long-term, okay? Mm. I know what you want to look like three months from now, but what about one year from now? And what do you think you have to do to maintain those results? Um, and honestly, sometimes people are just so stubborn that they will not listen to you until they've gone through all the frustrations themselves, all the you know extreme dieting cycles, all the yo-yo dieting, and finally they're just they finally get to a point there they, where they realize, well, this isn't working, so maybe I should finally try something different. And maybe I'm skeptical of this moderate method. I can't tell you how many times I start with a client. They go, first email, this is too many calories. I'm not doing enough cardio. You didn't give me enough training volume. You need to cut my calories more and do this and do this and do this. Almost all the time. Almost all oh, the I time. I can imagine. I'm like, hey, if you think it's so easy, then prove it. Yeah. Prove it by consistently adhering to this for two weeks. Your next check-in, we'll see where you are. Yeah. And pretty much always, they're like, oh my God, it's working. <laughs> I don't even, they're like, it's so funny because they're like, I feel like I'm beating the process because it didn't even feel that hard. I'm like, that's the goal. You do not yeah. want it to feel hard. If it feels easy and effortless, that's a good thing. You yeah. want to feel effortless for as long as possible. 100%. Um, so, anyway, those are my, yeah, those are my thoughts on all of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. You do have to wait for you know in your case in my case our clients to be ready to change and something i often tell people is you know maybe we shouldn't start now because you're not ready to change you know you do have to be getting a lot of pushback mm, yeah and you do have to be ready to change so when somebody accepts that they're ready to change you know what are the strategies to start making small changes and where should they start so where should they start is completely dependent on the individual. Mm -hmm. I am so against taking a cookie cutter approach where everyone does the same thing the first yeah. time. Everyone does. So what I, you know, with with my clients, I do a very, I have a very comprehensive questionnaire where they ask them about their lifestyle, their nutrition behavior, their exercise behavior. Um, do they have a support system in their in their life? All the everything, mm -hmm. and then I. From, from that, I can get a pretty good sense of where they are, what they're struggling with. For example, with women, it's very common to um, struggle with overeating at night mm -hmm. or overeating on the weekends, maybe with men also, um, and also with not consuming enough protein or just having sporadic meal patterns throughout the day from, from day, day after day. And so I can – I just – Look over their questionnaire, get a good sense of what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and then come up with one or two behavior goals that will address the weaknesses. So give them something something very concrete, very tangible, something that's very, very specific. All right, Jessica, for the next two weeks, I want you to have four square meals a day. No more eight meals one day, two meals another day, and then like one meal on the weekends. I want you to have four meals a day. And each meal, you're going to have a palm-sized portion of protein. Just super simple, yeah. you know? And yeah. just that, that in itself can add so much structure to mm. their nutrition. 
And if they know, okay, I can have four meals and I probably want to minimize my snacking, which by the way, I think snacking for most people tends to add a lot of mindless calories without actually mm, satiating definitely. the individual. Um, so if I say, okay, have four meals, three to four meals per day, um, add in protein, add in some good fats that'll keep you full. Um, and don't worry about anything else, nothing else. Don't worry about whether a quest bar is clean or dirty. Don't worry anything. I think those, you know, that's splitting hairs. And, um, then every two weeks assess their adherence, their progress, get their feedback. How are you doing? Is this hard? Is this easy? How automatic has this become? So then I'll say, okay, now you're going to do this for another two weeks because you're still working on it. Or I'm going to build upon the past two weeks and add in even more for you to do just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, it really is about meeting them where they are. And, uh, you know, a few months ago I made this Venn diagram actually a few years ago when I, um, first spoke at the ISSN conference in 2015, uh, June, I was making a presentation about, um, behavior change. It's funny. I'm still so interested in it now. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know back then how to, uh, make graphics on the computer. I'm just not a very tech savvy person at all. So what I ended up doing was I just kind of hand drew these <laughs> drawings like, of it, and I uploaded it. And so I hand drew these Venn diagram, you know, the circles that overlap in the middle. And I, and I um, still believe it now. You have what's practical in one circle. You have what's, uh, what science says is optimal for progress, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you got to find the overlap between the two. Yep. You got to find the intersection between the practical and optimal. And that's going to be different for every single person. So a good coach is going to recognize that and say, okay, you specifically, you, Jacob, you are really bad at this one thing. So we're going to do something that's going to help improve <laughs> that one skill. You're going to get yeah. better at this time. Whereas someone else, Sally, is bad at, you know, maybe not so skilled in this one area. So I'm going to address something completely different with her. Um, so I think that's that's where a coach can really come in handy is being able to objectively identify mm. your strengths and weaknesses. Um, also knowing just how much to give you. That's not too much. Uh, that's going to overwhelm you and set you up for failure in the long run. But also enough where you actually see progress over time. Mm. So that's what I like doing. For sure, a lot of good points there, and hundred percent, it is very much individual. But finding those weaknesses and developing skill sets and behaviors in areas that are letting you down is definitely key. And you spoke about there how you know we have to find that intersection, and this is something that I think is uh, very important for people because it it does you know typically get overlooked because people like to be at a hundred percent or they're off, you know, they're zero percent, they're a hundred or they're zero, and you know, I like to think of it, our fitness, more of a dimmer switch where we, you know, have periods where we turn things up closer to 100 and then we turn it back down, but we're never completely on or off. Um, obviously, right. like a contest prep is an example. So, you know, when somebody's trying to turn things up and control more variables without falling into the trap where they're, you know, grinding away and being on, what is your advice there? So when somebody started to get those habits and behaviors, and as you said, yeah. they're trying to progress and overload, you know, they might be starting to track protein and calories now. Like what are some of the things that you recommend being aware of when they're, when they're in this phase? How they feel physically, how they feel mentally, quality of life, mm. which I didn't mm. even think about this for the first six years of my fitness career. Didn't even cross <laughs> my mind. Um, how are your relationships doing with your friends and family? Um, how happy are you? Are you actually enjoying this? Are you freaking? Are you enjoying the process? Do you look forward to your workouts, or do you find yourself dreading your training sessions now? Mm. Um, and also listen to the feedback that you get from your your friends and family. If they're maybe starting to express some concern that this is um, not not too mentally healthy for you anymore, you probably should listen. Those are red flags that you should pay attention to. Mm. But um, for for women in particular, because most women, you know, they they want to diet, they want to lose weight. One thing that I always want to keep a pulse on is how do you feel? Are you drained? Are you very, very drained? Um, how are your cravings? Because typically, you know, when they start spiraling out of control, it's, it's not a good sign. When you start binge eating from dieting, that's a red, a huge, huge red flag. Mm. Um, with training, uh, obviously, same deal. How obsessive are you getting? Are you, do you throw a tantrum when you have to miss a workout one week uh, due to, to some, I don't know, unexpected family obligation? Um, how flexible are you with modifying your program when you're injured? Mm. Uh, that's a big problem with a lot of people is they all keep training through injury. And, um, or maybe when they're feeling sick, they'll show up to the gym anyway and they'll make themselves even worse. Um, and those are, uh, they make me nervous 
mm. um, because it's, it's really hard to tell people out of that mindset. So it if is. I can have them prepared beforehand, before they even go into it, then they could be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, but I'm also going to be keep having all these things in the meantime. And maybe every two weeks when I check in, I'm just going to ask myself, okay, how's my quality of life? Mm. Uh, am I enjoying this? Am I feeling good? All these things are such important, just simple, but really, really important questions that can shed a lot of light on um, how the whole process overall is going for you. Not just, am I getting stronger? Mm. But, uh, that Sure, that's important, but so are a lot of other things in life. There's a lot of, uh, there's a big gap in terms of what we measure in terms of our physique. You know, we obviously pay attention to aesthetics and the scale and measurements and our strength in the gym. But, you know, I'm, I'm writing an article on this at the moment, but we often overlook the, you know, the lifestyle and the psychological elements and how these three things are inextricably related. So some brilliant points there. And I guess one of the ways that you really understand how this plays a role in you achieving your fitness goals is your previous experience, you know, with some eating disorders. And obviously now being on the other side of those uh, is something that's quite, you know, amazing to see. So obviously... I would like to know what you feel was the catalyst for your change. Like how did you come yeah. to overcoming this? Like it's not something that many people can do uh, at all. So, you know, how did you do that, Sohi? You know, I wish I had some big life-changing like, moment where, oh, my God, I almost died in a car accident and it just was a huge – no, it was <laughs> honestly for me, it was just one of those things where um, I just was so unhappy with what I was doing. Um, I realized I was completely miserable, whereas before I would exercise and, you know, be outside playing baseball with my friends, playing tag and riding my bike and doing all those things because I genuinely enjoyed it. Um, and then all of a sudden it was something that I did for punishment because I had to. I feel obligated to. And I found myself. Um, let's say if I knew I had to go, I had to go on a, a three hour, um, run later in the day, which all self-imposed, then I would spend the entire day thinking about it and thinking about how much I dreaded it and how much I wanted it to be over. And, um, same thing with food. It was all about thinking about all the things I couldn't eat and, um, looking at other people with envy when I, they could eat a donut without a shred of guilt, um, and realizing why do they get to be like that? But I'm so unhappy. Mm. And then it just, I thought about it and I realized, you know, if this is what I have, if this is a life I want to, I have to live for the rest of my life, I don't want it. I just don't want to live this way anymore. And so, um, I mean, it was a very, very slow, gradual process, several, several years. Um, but I just, you know, I started eating more and, um, oh, and then a big thing for me was when I, in 2008, so nine years ago, January, I uh, discovered weightlifting. Uh, I got into the whole cleaning phase, like many people. Um, I actually bought Tosca Reno's, I forgot, Clean Eating Bible or something like that, one of those books. And it actually was really helpful in a lot of ways. I learned about the macronutrients for the first time. Oh, this is protein, this is a carb, this is a fat. I had no idea before. Le legit, had no mm. clue about nutrition. Um, did not know whether butter was actually a carb or fat, just, just, you know, just zero knowledge. Yeah. Um, learned about how to do stuff properly, how to lift weight, good form. And, um, you know, I was still a far, far away from learning how to design an effective program and everything. And, um, but I started lifting weights. I was still doing tons of cardio, but I started eating a lot more protein. Um, even though my calories were still pretty low and my body composition slowly started changing. And then, um, from there, I would uh, I just started lurking on different fitness forums and reading different fitness blogs online. And I was that kid in college in a lecture. I'd have my laptop open, pretending to take notes, but really I'm reading other people's blogs. Yeah. Um, so that's what, I, yeah, that's what I was doing. And so that way, I kind of learned a lot about um, lifting and how to, you know, good form and um, addressing all the common fitness and you know, nutrition myths. Um, stuff like that. So that's really what it did, did it for me. So I would say probably the biggest thing is um, learning to lift weights and understanding mm. the role that it can play. Even as, a, even as a female, all the great things it can do for your body, your confidence, your life overall. 
And um, so then that started my gradual shift from doing more and more and more and more and more cardio to now where I live four days a week. I maybe go on walks every now and then, but I don't do any formal cardio on top of that um, besides yeah. just running errands throughout the day and whatnot. So, so um, yeah, it took me a long time from one extreme to the other extreme and now I'm in the happy medium. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's yeah. so it's so good to see your journey and I guess that's what makes uh, – you so powerful in being able to help other people is that you have walked the walk, you've experienced, you know, the yeah. low points and you've come out on top, which just gives you even more credibility, uh, so he and one thing that I, you know, that I'm always interested in is, you know, the psychology. I'm very much like you. I, I really love what goes on between here, um, you know, at various time points. Uh, yeah, I, I guess from down, from here down, it's easy. But, you know, when we start including this thing above our head, it, uh, everything gets a little bit harder. If you can get this straight, everything else is easy. Yeah. But exactly. if you, you can't, then you'll just, you'll never get anywhere um, long term. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I wanted to know, what was your internal dialogue like back then, you know, you obviously started touching on it there versus yeah. now and what were the steps that you took to change that internal dialogue? Um, and, you know, did you see a professional? Did you, you know, use meditation? Did you start a gratitude journal? Was it, you know, what process uh, oh. helped you change if there was anything? I wish Oh, uh, yeah, I, I wish that I had seen a professional because I think it would have expedited my recovery by so much. But mm. a lot of what I had to do was um, on my own. You know, in my culture where I come from, it's eating disorder, they're not really recognized. It's kind of seen, um, I, I think it's different now, but at least 15 years ago, it was kind of seen as the norm almost where um, my friends would brag about how little they'd eaten that day. And it was like a bragging contest, you know? Uh, whereas I know in America, it's very, very different, maybe in Australia as well. Um, so I did not see professional, unfortunately. My dialogue back then was horrible. It was just, um, I wasn't worthy unless I weighed less than a certain number, just some arbitrary number. And back then it was 80 pounds. If I weighed less than 80 pounds, I was happy. I was good. If I if I was above that, I was, um, I was fat. I was shit you know all these things and um it was all like you know i'm not i, I don't feel accomplished for the day if, if i don't do three hours of cardio if i don't do five thousand sit-ups if i don't do 300 sit-ups or uh, push-ups every single day and it was just you think about it, it doesn't even make sense these are completely arbitrary rules i made made up for myself but i just stuck to them so stubbornly um it was also you know i was very much into comparing um, how skinny I was compared to someone else next to me and why are their legs thinner than mine and I feel like I'm working so much harder and it's not fair that she can stay leaner than I am and I and she doesn't even try she doesn't even try hard and um, yeah I just always comparing myself to other people um, always picking myself apart in the mirror never really liking what I saw and um it was a lot for me the the what changed was really paying attention to how other people live their lives and how other people, not everyone, but some people were so good at, um, no matter what they looked like, just being happy mm. and being pleasant to be around. And I noticed that um, the people who had a lot of friends and were well-liked had nothing to do with what they, what they looked like, had nothing to do with their physiques, with their bodies, had more to do with their personalities and how do they treat other people and all those things. And I realized oh, okay, so maybe looks don't matter quite so much anymore. So when I'm chasing some elusive um, physique that I'm probably never going to attain, uh, why not try to figure out something that actually works for me? And the other thing that changed too was realizing that you tend to believe the things you tell yourself over and over. Mm -hmm. You know? For sure. Um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not very objective human beings. Um, <laughs> so you can change your internal dialogue, change the way you talk to yourself. And I think, you know, I know a lot of people think that daily self affirmations are so cheesy and corny, but they're really, really, really effective. Mm. Um, if you catch yourself thinking like, "Oh my, God, you're so ugly, you're fat, you're worthless," and you actively go out of your way to change that to, you know, "I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm intelligent," and you tell us, you tell you tell yourself that every single day. Um, that's pretty empowering, and mm. that does a lot for your self confidence and overall well being and happiness. So um, actively changing your self-affirmations um, 
even even writing down simple statements that you're gonna say out loud to yourself every day um, can can do a lot to shift mm. your mentality, shift the way you, you think of yourself, and just become more positive overall. Definitely, definitely, and I, I'm a big believer in self affirmations, and I really do try not to have beliefs, uh, you know, per se, because obviously that can lead you down some tricky paths in general, but it does play a role in changing our subsequent behaviors, you know, and I think that is the big thing there in, you know, making sure that what you say is to yourself is conducive with what you want because your actions will typically follow that path. And another question I had for you, so he was, it's obviously unrealistic to expect perfection. You know, once you start these affirmations or you start this process of changing your internal dialogue, you know, I'm just going to prevent this, you know, eating pattern and I'm going to be healthy again automatically. There's obviously going to be relapse and, you know, setbacks within this. So what are your suggestions to people who do, you know, fall back into their old eating patterns and mindset uh, to help overcome that? Um, so how to move away from black and white thinking, you know, a lot of that has to do with changing the way you think about failure. Mm. I'm very big on learning from your mistakes. Always. You can always learn something from every single, yes, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And Carol Dweck does Mm. a lot of research on that. Um, she has got the book mindset, a really, really easy read. If, um, any of the listeners are interested in learning more about it. Uh, basically, you know, growth mindset says that I, I, um, I see a challenge as an opportunity to learn and improve upon myself. I am excited by, um, new obstacles. I see mistakes as, uh, not as a failure, but there's, uh, just telling me what I, what I can improve upon. Whereas fixed mindset, it's very like, you know, they shy away from challenges. They don't want to improve. Mm. If they get a B on a math test, they're like, Oh, this is proof that I'm not cut out to do math and they'll stop trying. And, and always has an excuse for why something's not working out the way they, they want to go. And, um, so, and the research has shown consistently that those with a growth mindset do better in life. Mm. Um, and so for me, you know, I write a lot, about, a lot about it in my book as well. Um, eat, live, thrive, learn to reframe your mistakes as okay. Um, you know what? I, I, I last night I overate, I went off plan and I overate and I had a, you know, a whole can of brownies, but what can I do moving forward? to prevent that from happening again. What does that tell me? Okay, I probably wasn't eating enough during the daytime. Um, probably shouldn't have brownies in the home in the first place if if they're going to be a trigger food for me. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, remove all the junk food from my home or at least make it harder to access, um, mm-hmm. you know, referencing what we talked about in the beginning. Um, I am going to make sure I stay pop- properly feel- fueled throughout the daytime so that I don't find myself ravenous at night. And then when evening hits, I'm going to, instead of turning to food when I feel stressed out or bored, I'm gonna find, and maybe drink, um, sip on some hot tea, maybe read a book, maybe go on a walk, and find some alternative uh, methods of stress relief and boredom relief instead. So those are all really proactive ways of reframing your mistakes. And um, it takes practice. Mm. And, um, you know, saying besides the on and off switch, the dimmer, what I like to say is, Instead of seeing it in black and white, get comfortable in the different all the different shades of gray. Yeah, and that's what I, like I say. That. Get comfortable in the gray area. Yeah, and um, that's really what it is. It, it's it's uh, it's getting comfortable with the discomfort, sitting with the uneasy feeling of God. I didn't go all out today. I wasn't all or nothing today, and it feels not quite right. But you know what? If I sit with this, just go to sleep tomorrow. Do it again. Uh, the more I practice it, the, the more natural it'll feel over time. And, you know, now I'm at the point where, like, everything I do is all in shades of gray now. <laughs> and, uh, which, you know, just a few years ago, I would not have been able to say this. So mm. it really is a skill. Um, even thinking a certain way, I think, is a skill. you got to practice it, put the repetitions in, and that's how you'll get better over time. For sure. I definitely agree. And it's funny that you bring these things up because on the last episode of the podcast, I had Ryan Doris. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ryan. Um, he's a he's a natural pro bodybuilder. But he was talking about literally the exact same uh, concepts surrounding like changing mindset. And, you know, it isn't uncommon amongst, you know, successful people like yourself to have these, you know, commonalities in the way that they think. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about in regards to the fitness industries, because you've obviously 
quite successful to a large degree and you, you associate with a lot of people who are extremely successful in their own right. So what are the, some of the common traits that they possess, as including obviously you know, this growth mindset? You know, all the successful people that I know are very clear on what their end goal is, what their mission is. They're usually very passionate about one thing or another, and they keep that the main focus. And um, I'm not sure this is quite what you were asking, but the other thing that I noticed as well, that people who tend to succeed long term and um, not only gain a big following, but also have respect uh, mm. of, of their followers, you know, having a lot of fo- you know, they're distinct. You can be famous but not really have the respect, but you can have the respect and have a big following. I think it's a win if you can have both, you know? Yeah. If you conduct yourself with integrity, if you're in the industry for the right reasons, you genuinely want to help people, you try to learn and, and improve upon your craft over time. Um, you're not just in it for the for the money. You're not just chasing money. You don't take sleazy shortcuts. Um, you, 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 you keep to your word. You follow through on projects, all those things. Um, really do a lot to, uh, add, they, they add up over time. Mm. And so, um, you know, besides growth mindset, I found that in general, I think people who kind of, um, have a very, they stay focused on task. So maybe they have one or two big projects right now. They don't have eight, eight different projects of juggling. Um, and they're scattered. They're all over the place. Cause if you have eight different priorities, guess what? They're no longer priorities. They're just kind of mm. all stuff happening in your life you're not able to give all those things um your top attention um so staying focused always trying to learn um staying connected to your colleagues mm, you know really uh, you, well. just a handful of people you maybe support your mission have the same vision as you do and you can talk to them um regularly text call whatever email and um sh- share research if you're interested into the research uh, here's a paper you might find interesting, or here's what I found worked really well on social media, or this post didn't do too well, let's talk about it, or something like that. Those can be really, really, really helpful, mm. especially online nowadays. There's a lot of negative. I'm sure you know, there's a lot of negativity. Uh, it can be very, very discouraging. Um, so having other people to talk to mm. and um, surrounding yourself with positive people who actually motivate you and inspire you to be better and um, really, really that's it. Yeah, and just being consistent over time. I always say that, you know, there are people who five years ago were so popular in the industry. I'm sure you can think of a few. Yeah. Five years ago, they're like, you know, they're like, oh, my God, they're so popular. They're amazing. And now, where are they? What are they doing? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing anymore. Um, maybe because they got complacent or maybe because they made tons of money off of a project and then just stopped uh, producing content anymore because it turns out what they were really after was to make a lot of money or yeah. whatever it is. And I find that the people who succeed in the long run, they're – they consistently produce quality content. You yeah. always see them on your feed, on your social media feeds. They're always doing things. They're always trying to educate their followers, try to give out free information, which, by the way, takes a lot of time and energy. Yeah. I don't know if everyone, people don't even realize how much time. I would say, talking to a colleague, I think I spend probably three plus hours a day giving away free information, and most people can't even say they can't say that about their about their careers. Yeah. Um, so that's very, very draining. And um, the other thing too is finding a balance. Um, something I always struggle with is finding a balance between not being overworked, not being on your phone all the time, and having a life outside of, mm. of that as well, being present with your family members, being a good friend, and so on. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I couldn't agree more with everything you've said there. And I guess to be consistent over time, like you uh, mentioned at the start of your answer to that question, was you need yeah. to have a good reason why. So, so he, I, I want to know what's your reason why and what is your definition of success? Yeah. Yes, okay, so for me specifically, very clear on this, um, came to me, I would say, six or seven years ago before I even started my career. I was still a college student. And this is when I was working with, you know, I had worked with a number of different coaches as a client myself. And I noticed that I knew what to, I had to do. Oh, just stick to the freaking plan. But I couldn't do it. I, cu- I could in the beginning, but eventually I was just hit or miss. And I was like, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me why I would know exactly what to do. I have the knowledge, but the application is not there. Why is that? And so I started wondering and wondering. And then I realized, okay, there's going to be a missing component that the fitness industry is just not addressing. And I realized it was the psychology. It was the behavior change. Mm. Everyone is so obsessed with finding, okay, is high carb better or is low carb better for weight loss? Is this better or that better? Is this program, is DUP better than whatever? And this and this and this. 
those are all irrelevant if you don't address the mindset first. If you can't find practical strategies that work for you as the individual, whatever is optimal, as I was saying before, doesn't matter at all. So then I realized, okay, there's got to be something with habits and mindset and maybe even willpower that I'm not fully understanding. So that's when I started to um, read books and then started to go do research. And that's why now I'm in grad school. My whole, my whole goal with being in grad school is to learn how to read research, which I'm doing now. It's been really, really cool. And you'll see more, you know, compared to like one or two years ago, I'm citing a lot more research now. And it's very cool. It's been awesome to be in that place. I and, love um, it. I really, I really want more men, but specifically more women. I really to move in that direction. I think we need more, more women in the industry who are, you know, speak, care about the research and whatnot. Um, so one is to read research, and two, my other goal is to know how to learn how to conduct research on my own, which I'm doing now also. I want to publish original papers, and uh, but beyond that, my long, long-term goal for fitness ultimately is to really ra raise awareness about the importance of mindset, about the importance of understanding behavior change. Because um, I saw this, I noticed, you know, five, six years ago, seven years ago, no one really talked about it. It wasn't the cool thing to do, and but I'm realizing, no, this is the important stuff. Hundred percent. I would argue it's more important than anything else, and. Um, it's been tricky because, you know, I've been told by numerous people, even colleagues, you know, so he, you know, psychology is not that popular and the behavior change not really that cool or sexy. I know that, but I can try. You know what? I'm passionate about this. And um, I think I'm starting to make a little bit of a difference, hopefully more and more over time, where I get people to realize, you know, the, the coolest thing the other day was um, when I get, the, I love when I get these messages. This girl messaged me. Hi, Zoe. I, uh, last I talked to you was back in May, two, two and a half months ago. Since then, I've been, you know, I, you convinced me to. I cut down on my exercise. I only work out two, three days a week. I'm more flexible with my my nutrition than ever. My, I'm actually eating more calories. And you know what? My waist size has gone down. <laughs> I'm feeding better into my genes, and my quality of life has improved. I feel better actually. And I'm like, God, if I can get everyone to be like this. Yeah. I want, I win, I win, that's it. And um, dude, that kind of stuff, just like, I get goosebumps reading stuff like that. I'm like, I'm doing something that actually matters. Um, I'm not just promising 30 day results and then I don't care what happens to you afterwards, bye, I got your money. I care about teaching you the, t the tools, the mental tools and the behavior change tools that you can implement and take away with you to last the rest of your freaking life. Mm. So you don't have to slave over fitness anymore. You don't have to go out to eat and stress out about your nutrition. You go and go on vacation and actually relax um, instead of worrying about where you're going to eat and how you're going to get your protein and how you're going to work out. And, um, you know, I used to be like that, and it's just not worth it. So uh, that's my main goal, and obviously you can tell I get really, really fired up about it. It's very <laughs> cool. It's very cool. This, but um, that, that's my mission is to um, – Stop getting people to think in such extremes and such black and white and kind of bring them back to the middle. And it, it's really, really cool to see the research too. And uh, I'm supporting a lot of what I said about behavior change. It's not about having more willpower. It's about having better habits. And um, it was such an exciting moment for me. I think it was back in January, February, I was eating lunch at school in between classes and I was reading this research paper and I found this one line that said the exact thing, you know, um, lasting weight loss is not about more self-control it's about having better habits and I was like oh my god I've been saying this forever so it's it's just so it's a cool thing for me to see and I hope to uh, conduct more research in that area so we can shed more light on um, what specific maybe um, health behaviors are more effective than others and, and, and things like that and and right now specifically my master's thesis I'm actually trying to compare the macros based versus habits based approach um, yeah, and Looking, it's, it's pretty cool. It's not been done before, and I, yeah. right now I'm, you know, obviously because I'm in a psych in a psych program, I'm trying to approach it from a psychology angle. So I'm measuring um, differences in binge eating and emotional eating, all that stuff like that. And my prediction is, and I'm I'm sure there's literature for this that I haven't found yet. My guess is that um, binge eating is uh, more predictive of of long-term weight loss success or failure. Yeah. That's my prediction. So if yeah, I can say, okay, um, this base group has lower rates of binge eating and um, emotional eating and just lower rates of disordered eating behavior in general, that's probably predictive of mm. better long-term su success. That's my prediction. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see what the research says. 
that'll be interesting uh, to see the results of that. And so he actually answered my subsequent question, which was, yeah. what's next for Sohi? So you've, you've done that. Yeah. And it's very cool to see you now taking a you know different path in your journey in your fitness yeah. career and you're only going to contribute more and more uh, information that's going to yeah, help so. help a lot more people uh, you know find that gray area and really start making those lasting changes they need to to achieve their fitness goals so can't thank you enough for having you on the show today and being here oh. talking to us all I really appreciate it I know you're extremely busy so thank you for being on Sohi and we'll speak to you next time all right thanks for having me not a problem thank you Thank you.